Good afternoon. Uh, we are all honored to welcome you to the Barkin Lecture in Pancreatology, which was made possible and conceived by one of our former fellows, Vikas Karana, who's an NIH-funded researcher and GI program director, period. This year, you're really having a stalwart of advancement, a champion of equality, inclusion, uh, Dr. Darwin Conwell, who is chairperson of internal medicine at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, period. His advancements in science with over 300 publications have truly improved the quality of life for patients with pancreatic diseases. He's been funded by both the NIH, the NIDDK, National Center for Advancing Transitional Science, as well as the American College of Gastroenterology and the National Pancreatic Foundation. When you really know Darwin and look at his CV, the first thing he puts up is that he's a mentor. He's a mentor for medical students to professors of medicine. He is so good at this that he's received Teacher of the Year uh, at almost every place he's been. He's been Teacher of the Year at the Cleveland Clinic. He's received the Jerry Trier Award for Excellence in Teaching at Brigham and Women's. And he's received the Harvard Medical School Tutor Award. He served us as academic pancreatologists by being president of the American Pancreatic Association. Colleagues, we are all honored to have Darwin Conwell, who's an amazing, caring person, a mentor, a clinical scientist, and a leader as our lecturer. I guess best of all, I'm fortunate to be able to call him a friend. He's truly a prophet in his own times. Darwin. Okay, can, can you all hear me? All right, thank you very much, uh, Jamie. I really appreciate that introduction. And I, you know, I'm just blessed to be here. I, I thank God for the, the ride that I've been on and it, it continues. And so we'll, we're gonna press on a little bit further. I, I'm getting grayer, but um, I got a legacy. <laughs> I got a legacy award from the National Pancreas Foundation. I got up, I said, well, I have to say, I think this means I'm getting old. <laughs> but um, I really appreciate this and to be a part of this um, Barkin Lecture. And, and Jamie and I go back a long time. So um, we just really just honored um, to be part of this. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so this is Medical Grand Round. So um, it, 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 we're going to leave you with really a couple articles for you to go back and review um, on acute pancreatitis and chronic pancreatitis as an internist, right? To kind of get you updated on what is the state of the art of acute pancreatitis, state of the art for chronic pancreatitis. We're gonna um, really leave you with some mechanistic underpinnings of pancreatic disease. So you because that's really what it's all about. If we understand why someone gets pancreatitis, acute or chronic, we can really understand how to treat um, the diseases. Also, we're gonna talk about some uh, NIDDK consensus um, uh, conferences that usually are like the Wednesday before Pancreas Fest has been in Pittsburgh for the past 20 plus years, where we look at research gaps and opportunities in pancreatitis. We'll, we'll touch on that. But I'm, I'm going to give you some executive summaries of acute and chronic and really focus on two articles for you to review and update yourself on acute pancreatitis and chronic pancreatitis, whether you are a infectious disease, nephrologist, because this is medical grand rounds, you're a resident, um, we want you to be updated on this. And we'll talk about some clinical trials that we are participating in across the country in some U01 consortiums. And uh, then we'll, we'll, wrap, we'll wrap things up. So the natural history of acute pancreatitis and recurrent acute pancreatitis called RAP results in progressive fibrosis and loss of uh, function. Can you see my pointer? No, okay, fine, that's, that's good for me to know. Um, but you can see acute pancreatitis, the AP attacks, and as these 
progress over time, patients will start to get fibrosis and scarring of the pancreas where they start losing pancreas function. If you lose the astronaut cells and the secretion of enzymes, you're going to get, um, you're going to get osteoderia. If you lose the islet secreting cells, you're going to get diabetes. You may have to have surgery. You're going to have pain. So this is as the, as the, as the gland starts to fibrosis and scar, you lose normal cells and normal function uh, of the gland. And this RAP or recurrent acute pancreatitis is really the strongest risk factor for the progression to chronic pancreatitis with a hazard ratio of four and a half. So this comes from uh, an article from Dr. Yadav and Gastro that shows how you can go from acute pancreatitis to recurrent acute pancreatitis to chronic pancreatitis in a small subset are, are predisposed to get pancreas cancer. So, and usually, um, you know, Jamie will tell you, I mean, the, the, this happens in front of your eyes. The gland is so dysmorphically altered in chronic pancreatitis with calcifications and dilated ducts. It's hard to see anything. Uh, it's hard to find a tumor in there. They just pop up in your office with, now I've got cancer. Uh, fortunately, it doesn't happen to a lot of the patients, but when it does happen, it's, it's really a tragedy uh, for us. But the risk of RIP is primarily influenced by etiology. If you continue to drink, continue to have insult to the pancreas, you're going to get um, chronic uh, pancreatitis. And this is some of the Pittsburgh data and some of the Germany data showing alcohol as a major um, factor for recurrent attacks. Obviously, if you continue to drink and alcohol is the etiology, that's going to lead to a problem. Again, data from uh, across uh, the world, whether it's Germany, Japan, Denmark or USA, alcohol is a, is a big factor um, in this, especially if you continue to drink um, and continue to insult and injure your pancreas. And that leads to um, what is the underlying mechanism why recurrent acute pancreatitis causes a problem. If you look on the left, you see SAPE, that stands for the Sentinel Acute Pancreatitis Event Hypothesis. So the initial injury to the astro cell, whether it's alcohol or gallstones or hyperlipidemia, or some form of oxidative stress, sets in the sets in the sets sets the stage for potential progression to stellate cell fibrosis, stellate cell mediated fibrosis and scarring. Now, if you can remove the stimulus, you have the opportunity for this to not progress. But if you continue to drink, um, if you don't fix the hyperlipidemia, if you don't um, um, take out the gallbladder, um, you're going to have a problem. And it's, you're going to have recurrent acute pancreatitis, and that's what's going to set you up for chronic pancreatitis. And we know this is a stellate cell mediated phenomenon with, um, with TGF beta and other uh, inflammatory cytokines mediating the, this and going from a quiescent stellate cell to an activated stellate cell that lays down uh, fibrotic material, just like it, it occurs in the um, in the liver where you have the hepatic uh, stellate cell. So removal of the stimulus that's causing the recurrent attack is very important. So this was uh, this hypothesis was um, put the, put the, put forward by Dave Wickham at the University of, uh, of Pittsburgh. So again, so how do you go from a quiescent stellate cell to an activated stellate cell where there's a lot of activation and a lot of fibrosis and scarring? And this is it's really a, um, a cytokine, chemokine mediated um, process that leads to this and results in uh, damage to your uh, gland. A new conceptual, what we call a mechanistic model, has been proposed where you have stages of disease, where you are at risk, where you have susceptibility factors. They may be genetic, it may be um, you know, alcohol predisposition, there may be some other factors that you have in your genes uh, that may predispose you to this, but then you may have an injury, the SAPE hypothesis. Remember, you have this sentinel event, all right? If you progress to RAP, recurrent acute pancreatitis, you can progress into chronic pancreatitis. And even chronic pancreatitis goes through stages. The problem is we have a very difficult time diagnosing early, early chronic pancreatitis. What exactly is that? What does that look like? We know what the end stage looks like where you have calcifications and you have fibrosis and you may have diabetes and you have steatorrhea. We know what that looks like, but in between is where we really have a hard time of making that diagnosis. And there's a lot of emphasis right now 
in our chronic pancreatitis, diabetes, and pancreas cancer uh, UO1 consortium, trying to develop biomarkers of early detection. And that biomarker may be a, a, a radiographic biomarker. It may be MRI uh, changes. It may be uh, something found in the blood or in the urine or in the saliva that can help us differentiate that this person is going from an acute pancreatitis and a recurrent acute pancreatitis to a chronic pancreatitis um, state. So let's, with, with that as a backdrop and understanding that, you know, the most common causes are alcohol, gallstones that can lead to acute pancreatitis. Um, and then if you continue to have recurrent attacks, you can get chronic. Let's talk about acute pancreatitis in more of an executive summary type uh, way. So this is the article I'd, I'd want you to pull um, to read. Uh, I would, you know, medical students, residents, fellows, even if you're not, they are not in GI, the GI space, this is a great article um, to read to kind of summarizes a lot of our um, recent advances and where we are with uh, acute pancreatitis. The American College of Gastroenterology is now writing, uh, they're updating their guidelines for acute pancreatitis. So that's gonna be coming out here in the next year or two, um, part of that, honor to be part of that uh, committee. But what I wanna show you is most patients over here to the left have mild acute pancreatitis. A small subset, you know, you know, 10, 20% can develop severe pancreatitis. And when you get severe pancreatitis, you're set up for necrosis of the gland where the gland loses part of its blood supply. And when you have a necrotic pancreatitis, that sets you up for infection and sets you up for a higher uh, mortality, morbidity and mortality. What you see below this figure on the left is where you see microlithiasis. That's the most common cause, or also called gallbladder sludge. That's the most common cause for um, idiopathic, we call idiopathic acute pancreatitis. And those patients, if you do an ultrasound in between the attacks, you will probably see the sludge that can justify a cold cystectomy. And some, uh, some people will go ahead and take the gallbladder out. You've had recurrent attacks and everything's negative. And because you know they're probably passing some sludge. And that sludge is composed of um, cholesterol or calcium uh, crystals or cholesterol monohydrate crystals or calcium bilirubinate um, granules. What you see in the middle are three CT scans that you need to understand. So why do we get a CT scan? We don't get a CT scan really to diagnose acute pancreatitis. The diagnosis of acute pancreatitis is based on really three things, um, two or three things, whether you have abdominal pain, a lipase greater than three times the upper limb of normal and abnormal uh, imaging, two out of the three. So a lot of times patients come with abdominal pain and if you, in the ER, ER doctor usually gets um, a, an amylase or lipase as part of their workup and the lipase is up, then that, that's pancreatitis. Now, a lot of times before we get to them, the ER physician has already done the CT scan. Unfortunately, it doesn't give you the information that you want. It may show some inflammation to confirm what you already know, great. But really you can get fooled by getting a CT scan too early because the patient's not been hydrated. And what you wanna know when you get a CT scan is whether or not someone has necrosis or not. And you don't need to know that unless the patient's not getting better. Because 80 to 90% of patients do very well. They're, they leave the hospital in three to five days and they have what we call interstitial pancreatitis, which is the upper um, image, which is where the blood supply to the pancreas is preserved. And how do you know that? Well, you give them, they, have, they have an IV bolus uh, CT scan. You look at the, a the aorta, you look at the uh, kidneys, you see they're all lit up nicely. Look at the liver, it's lit up. And then look at the pancreas. The pancreas is also lit up homogeneously, but there's fluid around it, but the pancreas is completely uh, bright. That means the blood supply has been preserved. So that's interstitial pancreatitis. When someone has necrotizing pancreatitis, and you're concerned about that after about 48 to 72 hours and patients are not getting better because the majority of patients, once you rest their, once you, once you um, give them some pain medication, give them some fluid and um, decrease their dietary intake some, I wouldn't completely eliminate their diet, but you will start to see that they get better. They, they start to get better right away. But if they're not getting better, that's when your concern is, does this person have necrosis? And that's when you need your CT scan. You need to hydrate them, give them, give them a, get a really good uh, contrast bowl of CT. Look at the aorta here. The aorta is bright. 
the liver is bright, but look at the pancreas above it. It's dark. There's also air pockets in it. This person has necrosis, and this person is uh, is uh, is going to be predisposed to have, you know, prolonged um, systemic inflammatory response syndrome, multi system organ failure, may end up in the ICU on a ventilator. So you got to be very careful uh, with uh, these patients and notify your ICU team that we may be transferring a patient. Um, be ready for them in case they start to crash or things start to get worse. Um, now, walled off necrosis is what occurs after four to six weeks of having necrosis. This, this stuff starts to liquefy and you end up with a rind or a wall around this um, necrotic uh, collection. And this is where your advanced endoscopist can sometimes go in and do some really nice things with endoscopic ultrasound and self-expandable metal stents because you can see in this bottom image, the stomach has contrast and, and the stomach is just sitting right on top of this necrotic uh, wall of necrosis and they can actually go right in there and clean that out uh, if, if need be. Your radiologist can also do this. Surgeons can also do this, but we actually recommend a more of a stepped up approach where you start minimally invasive and then work your way toward surgery. Whereas before we used to do surgery right away and we found out that was not the, the brightest thing to do. The patients didn't do well with that approach. So over to your right, I want you to think, I've got some things circled for you. Um, so in the early phase, when someone comes in with acute pancreatitis, how do you hydrate them? You give them um, lactated ringers, and we'll talk about that. Someone may need an ERCP. That's when you've called your gastroenterologist in. You're concerned this is biliary uh, induced acute pancreatitis where your LFTs are also elevated and you're concerned about this. You call your gastroenterologist. You may have sludge or stones on your um, uh, ultrasound. You may have a dilated uh, duct and need to decide whether a person needs an ERCP or not. So one thing I want to say about imaging, what imaging studies should be done when someone has acute pancreatitis? It's an ultrasound. It's not a CT scan. The, the, the uh, ER doctor should be getting an ultrasound, not a CT. Unfortunately, the, the CT is done before you even get down there to the emergency room to see them. Um, but, but the ultrasound gives you the most information uh, early on, and that should be the imaging modality of choice. You can see a swollen pancreas. You can look at the, uh, at the biliary tree to see if it's dilated, to see if there's stones. You can look at the gallbladder to see if there's sludge or stones uh, in it. Later on, if they're not getting better, then get the CT scan after you've hydrated them to see if they have necrosis. All right. So what about the prophylactic use of antibiotics or probiotics? Not recommended. What about nasoenteric feeding? Definitely drop a tube down if you, if you can. Start to trickle feed them. We used to not feed people with acute pancreatitis. Actually, you can feed them. They'll get better with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, if they have stones, you need to get a cholecystectomy during that hospitalization or within four to six weeks after. Call the surgeon. They will let you know when is the best time. If they have a lot of necrosis or a lot of fluid, they're not going to want to do the cholecystectomy during the hospitalization. They're going to want to wait a little bit, but you want to get that done because they're going to have a recurrent attack. The step up approach is an approach to this walled off necrosis that I referred to. You really want to start more of a minimally invasive endoscopic approach, maybe a radiographic approach before you move toward a surgical approach to clean up uh, walled off necrosis that's symptomatic where persons may have fever, chills, nausea, vomiting, inability uh, to eat. Um, aftercare, very, very important to now understand if you have idiopathic, someone has recurrent attacks and you don't know why they're not drinking, um, you don't have stones, um, it's most likely microlithiasis and that gallbladder needs to come out, continue to follow them. Smoking and alcohol abstinence, very important. But the one thing that we, start, we are now starting to recognize is that up to 23% of patients that have acute pancreatitis and they don't have to have necrosis, will develop diabetes. And we don't know why that happens. We just don't know why that happens. And I had a very uh, great mentor, Peter Banks uh, in Boston, and he would tell me this. He said, you know, we got to bring them back. We got to see them in our pancreas clinic. We got to check those blood sugars. We got to tell the patients, be careful. They get lightheaded or dizzy. They may have a high blood sugar. And it's really interesting that this does occur. The extra insufficiency also can occur when there's no necrosis. And that's, you know, why would that happen? Well, maybe the pancreas uh, is stunned. In the old Dryling um, studies with Dr. Dryling, when he did a pancreas function test in patients with acute pancreatitis, there's a period where the pancreas is stunned. It doesn't appear to be working very well, but the, the cells are not um, 
necrosis, they're just not working very well. There's, there's inflammation, there's swelling, so it may take time for this to recover. This may also explain why patients with acute pancreatitis can sometimes just you know, really lose weight and then it comes back up, or they may have some gastroparesis and it comes back up. Things just are not normal. Inflammation can cause these types of problems and it may take time for you to provide supportive care for them to, to bounce back. So just keep those things in mind. So I would recommend you read this uh, paper um, and for uh, just a review and update of where we are with the management of acute um, pancreatitis. So let's talk about mechanisms. Why do we do what we do? This is just one example. Why do we give lactated ringers over given uh, saline? Well, this is my contribution to medicine. This is uh, when I was at the Brigham, we did this study, randomized control trial, looking at lactated ringers versus normal saline. And we looked at two, two other things. We looked at one other thing, which was goal-directed resuscitation versus standardized approach based on weight and response. And so when you look at this, we had four different arms. You're randomized to goal directed with lactated ringers or a goal directed with normal saline or just standard, whatever you think as the clinician, how much fluid they need with lactated ringers versus a standard normal saline. And what we found, if you look at the top right, um, top right figure is that there was no difference between uh, goal-directed or standard uh, therapy um, for development of SIRS. But what we did see is that lactated ringers versus normal saline, there was a statistically significant uh, difference on SIRS at admission and SIRS at 24 hours. You see lactated ringers really brought down your uh, SIRS at 24 hours. Going a little step further was what happens to you see reactive protein in goal-directed therapy versus standard therapy? No difference. But lactated ringers, a lower CRP versus normal saline. So there's something going on with lactate that appears to decrease SIRS, decrease inflammation that may be protective in patients that have um, that have um, uh, acute pancreatitis. Well, the reason that we did this study was because of Beach and Wu, who's the lead author on this, on this, who was a GI fellow at the time, had worked in Fred Gorlick's lab at Yale. And Fred Gorlick had said, listen, you know what? I think there's something with lactate here and you should probably do some studies with lactate. So we did this study, it's, this was an ACG, um, we, we, we didn't get any funding for this. We, we tried to get ACG grant, we tried to get, so this, this, this was done by, ourselves, our families, Beach and Wu's uh, brother was a computer person that did the randomization uh, for all four arms. And Peter threw in some money. We, I threw in some money, tried to get this uh, study done. We had friends in the ER, didn't charge us anything to get this done, but it was done, you know, grassroots. But later, Fred Gorlick's group published this paper from his work showing the mechanism, the mechanism behind how lactated ringers works and it has to do with its ability um, to mediate and shut down IL-1 beta. So what you see here is over to the right and up is that lactate um, through this GPR-81 uh, receptor actually shuts down the uh, inflammasome and that leads to a decrease uh, in the bottom right, a decrease in um, inflammation, a decrease in cytokine production. And that's the mechanism behind why lactate actually helps and decreases the CRP and uh, decreases the ability to decrease the SIRS in 24 um, hours. So mechanistically, this is the reason why you give lactated ringers. So when someone comes with acute pancreatitis, give them lactated ringers. And this has been validated in multiple um, studies. A lot of research gaps in acute and chronic pancreatitis. I would encourage those who want to do research in this to look at this paper from a um, consensus conference. And one of the things that we're looking at is what are some of the patient reported outcomes that should we have? And what are some of the designs of the trials? What are we trying to alter? So some of the patient reported outcomes were we need to look at pain, quality of life, nutrition, progression from acute to recurrent to chronic. Are there any surrogate biomarkers? Can we identify some of those? Some of the trials should be directed at pain. Some of the trials should be directed at natural history, mean, meaning can you, can you um, retard or slow the natural history or progression of the disease? Can you alter someone that has, has, has severe acute pancreatitis? That's what SAP stands for. Can you shut that down and keep them from ending up in the ICU on a ventilator? Are there drugs available to help um, arrest that inflammation that's going on? So these are some of the things to think about when designing trials in acute pancreatitis. 
we are part of a, a consortium. When I was at Ohio State, we wrote a grant and we're um, blessed to get uh, this uh, award along with other uh, centers that you see there um, called the T1DAPC, called the Type 1 Diabetes and Acute Pancreatitis Consortium. It's not type 1 diabetes as we know it. Um, the type 1 diabetes group provided a lot of the funding to support this. But what we're really looking at is diabetes that occurs after acute uh, pancreatitis. And what I said, 23% of patients in the second bullet can develop diabetes following an attack of acute pancreatitis. And we don't know why that happens. So um, the NIH put, the, put this announcement out and we now have you know, immunologists, um, geneticists, uh, diabetes experts trying to figure out what exactly is the mechanism behind why a subgroup of patients will get diabetes and others will not, and what's going on with the beta cells in terms of autoimmunity, and what are some of the patient risk factors, disease risk factors, and, and the mechanisms that are ongoing that are causing uh, this. And the primary objective um, of this uh, group is to determine the incidence and clinical characteristics of any type of diabetes after acute pancreatitis and to try to determine some clinical and mechanistic risk factors that may predict the development of diabetes and looking at, you know, beta cell function and some other things, uh, look MRI uh, imaging and um, developing uh, a robust biorepository to partner with other uh, basic scientists that are studying um, diabetes in this space to try to figure out what exactly mechanistically uh, is going on. So patients get enrolled with acute pancreatitis, and then three months after the enrollment, they start getting a lot of metabolic tests, and then they get followed up every um, year. So this shows you here at three months, people branch out into, there's 250 patients that are going to get an MRI. 600 patients will get a, a OGTT, 125 will get an OGTT and an MMT, 75 will get an OGTT and an FSIGT, and then of course a subset um, will be followed that develop um, pancreatitis, I mean, develop diabetes, and then they will get uh, an MMTT and continue to be followed. So we're going to be looking at, and there's a robust biorepository, we're collecting um, um, blood specimens from it, from these patients and all their derivatives. They're getting uh, MRIs, a separate NIH grant that's of course, the MRI um, portion uh, of this. And of course, all that baseline data, age, gender, race, do you smoke, do you drink, all those types of things that you're going to get, quality of life measures and things uh, going forward. And we'll, we bring them, at, bring them back every 12 months to repeat testing in, in some of these, uh, whatever arm they are in. So that's acute pancreatitis. Uh, in a nutshell, review article for you to look at, um, mechanistic um, rationale for why we give lactator ringers, and what the, where the research is going right now in the acute pancreatitis space. Now, as I said, acute pancreatitis can lead to recurrent acute pancreatitis, and that can predispose you to scarring, loss of astrocell cell function, uh, loss of duct cell function, um, calcifications that can lead to chronic um, pancreatitis. So this is um, a, uh, a, a workshop I was uh, honored to be uh, a part of with um, Aliyah Uch, who's a, um, the head of um, pediatric gastroenterology at University of Iowa. And we um, co-chaired this uh, session where we tried to look at chronic pancreatitis in the 21st Searching what are our research challenges and what are our opportunities? And these are all outlined. This is what the NIH is going to be funding for the next, you know, you know, 10 to 20 years in terms of chronic uh, pancreatitis. So this is a very important uh, paper that we wrote with a lot of key um, leaders across uh, the country and in the world. This is the paper I'd recommend that you read. Um, as I said, medical grand rounds. If you're a nephrologist, if you're a, a cardiologist, say, well, I, I want one article. I would read this article right here. Well written by uh, Vikesh Singh at Hopkins, who was one of, actually was one of my fellows many, many years ago uh, at the Brigham and uh, Dhiraj Yadav and, um, and also Dr. Garg. This is a well written uh, article. And what I'd like to walk you through, and I'm sorry my pointer doesn't work is look at the figure. So patients have to have symptoms that's suggestive of chronic pancreatitis, meaning they have uh, upper abdominal pain. They may have had a bout of acute pancreatitis. They may have recurrent acute pancreatitis. Uh, they may have diabetes or extra insufficiency. And you're concerned that this gland is becoming scarred. 
the first thing you should do is get a CT scan because you want to make sure there's not a mass. They don't have pancreas cancer. And if they have calcifications, you got the diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis. If they don't and you still are suspicious, the next step should be to get an MRI scan with or without secretin based on the availability at your institution. Um, and if that, does, if that shows you, yeah, they got abnormal ducts. They've got um, side branches. This looks like uh, chronic pancreatitis. You, you, you're done. But if that doesn't show it, the next step would be an endoscopic um, ultrasound, and hopefully that will, 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 will seal the deal for you. But if it, if it does not, it's pretty unlikely that they've got it. Um, if you still suspect they have it, you're going to need to follow them and see if they manifest um, something. Now, some centers can do a pancreas function test, but a lot of people are not doing that. We're trying to refine that even, even more where you put a tube down, a scope down, and stimulate the pancreas with secretin or CCK and measure um, electrolytes and enzymes in the pancreas fluid that you aspirate. That's a very time-intensive, laborious uh, test that allows centers are, are not doing. So that's really not really part of the algorithm uh, in, in most um, centers. It's mostly imaging combined with clinical symptoms to help you uh, try to get that diagnosis. Now, if you know the etiology, such as, you know, they're, they're, heavy, they're heavy drinkers or they're, they're smoking, they have hyperlipidemia, um, and those are all negative, you say, well, this is idiopathic, okay? If it's idiopathic chronic pancreatitis, now we know we, you should do genetic testing. They may have a CFTR mutation. They may have a spink mutation. Um, they may have a clotting mutation. So there may be something wrong with their calcium signaling, their, trips, their trypsinogen um, uh, in the in the Ashner cell. Um, so these are things that you should get now, which is genetic testing. And genetic testing, the cost is going down. Insurance companies are now starting to pay for it. Uh, if you have a geneticist see them ahead of time, that will help justify the, the rationale. And insurance companies are more likely uh, to pay for, pay for, uh, pay for that. Now, if you're moving toward medical management, what do I do with this patient? And the most of the time they have pain. Pain is the hardest thing to treat. Um, the uh, diabetes can be managed. The diabetes in chronic pancreatitis is a little more brittle. They have a lot of uh, uh, the, the glucagon cells, also the islet secrete, the, um, the insulin screen cells are also uh, off. So it's a little more hard to regulate it, but get it, bring an endocrinologist in to help you. The exocrine insufficiency can be treated with enzymes. Uh, as long as you give the right dose, you got you to dose it and got to get some experts in to help you give you at least 30 to 40,000 international units of lipase per meal. And you also need some with snacks. They need to stop drinking, need to stop alcohol. If that doesn't work, you know, the question is, is there some anatomical thing that can be done, whether that's done with endoscopy that you see over to the left where you can put a scope in, do an ERCP, clean out the pink duct, stent them, or do they need surgery where you can actually decompress the duct with a fry procedure uh, or a um, or a Pousseau procedure, which is a lateral pancreatic jejunostomy, to decompress um, um, the duct and decrease, decrease uh, tension and pressure, and sometimes that helps um, patients. When you compare endoscopy therapy to surgical therapy, surgical therapy is more long-term benefit. If you look at these patients in five years, surgical, surgery will outdo endoscopy uh, every, every time. But patients, I think a stepwise approach where, you, where you're going less invasive to more invasive is what patients are going to want to see done. They're, they're going to want you to try endoscopic therapy before you go to surgical um, therapy. And, and it makes sense uh, logically. The last resort is removing the entire pancreas, where you do a total pancreatectomy and try to um, transplant the ILS into the liver through the portal um, through the portal uh, vein. And that works in, in, in the right patient. You got to have a, the right selection criteria. I would recommend if you're at if you're at that point, those patients will what we call small duct disease, where they don't have a dilated duct with calcifications in it. Um, get them to a center that does this, where they have a, a, a committee, very similar to a um, a, um, a transplant um, board that looks at everything: the social uh, environment, you know, um, financial. Are they going to be able to afford enzymes the rest of their life? Do they have the support? system around them uh, to do this psychologically? Are they stable? Is this just a chronic pain syndrome? What exactly are you dealing with? It's, it, this is complicated. You have to make sure you do it in the right patient because what you don't want to do is do this and the person doesn't get better. And now they're a brittle diabetic in, in a few years. And you know that, that happens. And so you want to be very careful in your selection of, of patients for this. But this is a chronic pancreatitis. If you look at the images in the upper left, what you can see there is... Um, you know, a CT scan showing um, chronic pancreatitis with, you know, with a, with a big fluid collection, 
um, in there with calcifications. If you look in the middle, this is going to be an, an MRI, MRCP. You can see where the arrow is pointing to a filling defect in that pancreatic duct. This lit up nice and white um, is, is going to be a stone. Um, in, in, the, in the image to the right is an endoscopic ultrasound. This shows some shadowing where you've got a stone uh, also. So that's what these three different um, things look like. And this is like the same patient. That's their CT scan. It shows a calcification. The MRI shows the filling defect, same calcification. And the EUS showing the calcification with the shadowing. So there's different ways of seeing um, calcific chronic uh, pancreatitis. So review this article. I think it'll be very helpful for you to give you an update on where we are with chronic pancreatitis. Now, we were fortunate enough at Ohio State to get this U01 uh, uh, grant. Uh, this is called the Consortium for the Study of Chronic Pancreatitis, Diabetes, and Pancreas Cancer, along with these, um, these uh, centers. And uh, we are looking to study the natural history of chronic pancreatitis with, with a study we call the PROCEED uh, study. But there's also a diabetes um, study. There's also a cancer uh, study. But we're going to focus on pancreatitis. We're starting to get data coming out of this right now from the um, from the proceeds study. That's our um, paper in the upper left that kind of describes um, the methods. And in the upper right, we have standard operating procedures for biospecimens. The fortunate thing now is that the biospecimens um, um, a third, 25% to a third of these are being shipped to the DK central repository for anyone to be able to use along with um, a data dictionary with it. So you, so those these samples are gonna be available to also the general um, scientific uh, community. We've tried to standardize um, reporting of a CT and MRI and MRCP for the consortium. So we're all speaking the same language, whether you're in at Cedar sinai or you're at Ohio State, or you're in, in, in uh, Rochester, Minnesota, or you're in uh, Indianapolis, um, Indiana, we want to we want to speak the same language, and, and we're reading images the the, the same way. So, um, yeah. So if you, so if you look in the upper left, the what's the rationale for this study? And what are we trying to do? What's the primary outcomes for PROCEED is to establish a model longitudinal research co cohort of adults with chronic pancreatitis and to follow them over time for the new development of new onset diabetes and extra insufficiency. And in a small subset will get osteopathy, they'll get uh, pancreas cancer, but we're trying to set the platform or set the set the plate with um, patients that are really deeply phenotyped, and then we we're following them over time yearly, and we're getting samples as some of them progress. So we've been doing this for eight years. We got about four years of really nice, clean data on patients, and we've had about forty to fifty people develop diabetes, develop. Um, extra insufficiency. We've got four people that developed cancer. Uh, we have people now developing um, metabolic bone disease. So we're going to be able to look at their blood samples and imaging before they developed it. Um, and then look at the same blood samples in the same patient, perfect match control. Now they've got it. So what's different in those specimens? What's different in the blood? What's different in you know the imaging? That can Are there any signals along the way to tell all oh, this person is now starting to Something's changing in their um, microbiome. We have, we, have, we have stool. Something's changing in their microRNA. Something's changing in their proteomic profile, metabolomic profile. We've got saliva, urine, stool, blood, and imaging, CT scan, MRI scan, and follow-up uh, in these uh, patients. So it's going to be so it's very exciting. And at DDW this year, you'll see multiple uh, abstracts that are, that are coming out. So this is really the elephant on the couch, pain. Jamie will tell you, pain is it. This, this, this is why they're calling your office. This is why they're in the emergency room. And pain is very, very complicated in chronic pancreatitis. And there are, there are intrapancreatic, I just call this level one. There's things going on in the pancreas that predispose in the pain. We know in the older studies, if you actually look at the pancreas and under uh, H&E, then the nerves are big. They're inflamed. There's inflammatory cells around us. That's got to be a source of pain. We also know at the spinal uh, cord level, there's a hypersensitivity in the dorsal root uh, ganglia. We also know in the brain, there is uh, cortical reorganization, central sensitization. If you do functional MRIs on these patients that have chronic pancreatitis versus those that do not, things are different to the point where, like I told you before, we don't want to take a pancreas out um, for a total pancreatectomy until we are sure that the pain syndrome that they have is more about a pancreatic 
pain center because this surgery is on the pancreas. Your endoscopy is directed at the pancreas, removing the pancreas. But if their pain is now central, you take that pancreas out, they're still going to have their pain. Now they've got diabetes and they still have their pain. So selection is very, very important. It's just, and the simple analogy I use is you're riding your Harley Davidson down the road and you wipe out, you just wipe out, you're in a coma and you lose your right leg, but you're in a coma for a month. You wake up, you still feel you've got a right leg. Why is that? So for 45 to 50 years, you got signals from your right leg. I have a right leg, move my right leg. This is the phantom pain. It's the, it's the easiest way for me to explain this to people. My pancreas hurts, my pancreas hurts, my pancreas has been hurting for five years, 10 years, 20 years, and guess what? You take the pancreas out, and they still have their pain. Why is that? Because now we've got central pain. We've got cortical reorganization, central sensitization. Things have changed. You know, their, their, their pancreas hurts and the pancreas is gone. And we know the pancreas not functioning. They got diabetes. It's a rock hard gland. It's, it's calcified. It's not working. We have to give them enzymes because the astronaut cells and duct cells aren't working. We have to give them insulin because the islet cells aren't working anymore. The pancreas doesn't work but they've got pain and it's complicated. So be very, very careful when you're dealing with pain and chronic pancreatitis. And we've not figured it out yet. It's difficult. So this is a paper that Phil Hart and I wrote and you know, where the arrow says, there's no current therapies to delay or retard disease progression going into chronic pancreatitis, but there are ongoing efforts. That's the CPDPC that I told you about to more fully understand the natural history of chronic pancreatitis and its underlying mechanism because we're going to get biospecimens, phenotype, ask them questions, serially imaging, and try to find a biomarker, try to find imaging changes, try to find something that helps us say, this person progressed, this person did not progress. What's different about those people? Um, so these studies are expected to provide insights that will transform our approach to disease management and provide increased hope uh, for patients. So this is another NIH consensus conference. And what are some of the outcomes? The number one, pain, 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 and progression. Uh, trials should be looking at pain and the natural history of, uh, of pain. This is one NIH-funded study I wrote with Mark Topazian at Mayo Clinic when I was at Ohio State, looking at um, um, PGE2 as a mediator of inflammation and fibrosis. We know that P PGE2 does this. It mediates a uh, stellate cell uh, fibrosis. And we looked at some uh, pancreas fluid that we had at the Brigham um, in normal patients, those with minimal change, chronic pancreatitis based on EUS, all right? And then those with definite chronic pancreatitis. And what we saw was differential expression of PGE2 and bicarbonates. So we saw the bicarbonates are dropping in minimal change compared to controls and drop even more in chronic pancreatitis. But what we did see is that the pancreas fluid um, PGE2 levels went up in minimal change. It was higher than controls. It was higher than chronic pancreatitis. So the question is, could PGE2 be an early biomarker of the diagnosed chronic pancreatitis. So that's, so that's um, our interest, that's our pilot data. And so what we're doing now is we're uh, looking at endomethacin um, and repurposing this drug in a pilot study. This is funded by the NIH to look at PGE2 levels in pancreas juice and to see if endomethacin can alter your pain or quality of, of life. And this is a study, it's a 28 day study. Um, at baseline, we have questionnaires, biospecimens, imaging. We go down with a scope, collect pancreas fluid after secret simulation, and then we start endomethacin. They fill out a pain diary, symptom diary for 28 days. Then we go back down uh, after 28 days and collect fluid again, blood again, urine again, after they've been on endomethacin for a month. Now, that's not going to alter the natural history. We want to know, if is there a signal? Are we Is PGE2 elevated? And if so, does endomethacin drop it down? Because we know that PGE2 can mediate fibrosis. So that would justify a, um, a, a pilot study that's of longer duration and start looking at imaging changes, blood changes, symptom changes um, more long-term. 
I'll leave you with a couple other uh, studies that we're doing. Uh, when I was in Boston, we got involved in um, metabolic bone disease. We know that chronic inflammation induces um, an imbalance between osteoclasts and osteoblast activity. Remember, osteoblasts are laying down bone. Osteoclast is taking up bone. And we know this is a rank ligand, osteopontin-mediated um, uh, process that we see. This is from an IBD paper um, that talks about chronic inflammation and this imbalance. So we wanted to know, does this happen in chronic pancreatitis? So we know for a fact that um, patients with chronic pancreatitis are increased uh, risk of having bone disease. We've, we've shown this in some of our, of our studies, and they have the third bullet. They have multiple risk factors, smoking, vitamin D malabsorption, that's a fat soluble vitamin, fat maldigestion, alcohol abuse. Half of them are female. Females are predisposed. Chronic inflammation. These things may predispose to an imbalance in bone mineralization, remodeling, and an increased risk of hip fracture. And we showed that in our epidemiologic study in Boston, um, using the uh, partner's data, that chronic pancreatitis patients fracture just as much as IBD patients just as much as, as cirrhosis patients or post-gastrectomy uh, patients. Amazing. But there's no guidelines for this for chronic pancreatitis. So um, we looked at our, well, this is one other paper from uh, Dr. Dugan looking at in, inflammatory mediators, high, highly sensitive CRP, also bone-related biochemistry, where that's P1MP, osteocalcin, raised uh, CTX1, 20-hydroxy vitamin D, and they found differences in controls and, and chronic pancreatitis patients, small numbers, but there was, there was definitely uh, signals there that shows that chronic pancreatitis patients, they're inflamed, there's systemic inflammation, and there's also bone demineralization. So we looked at our data um, here in our proceed study at baseline to see if um, we want to report the prevalence of osteopathy in our chronic pancreatitis uh, data set and to see if there's any differences in, in our patients compared to controls. And what we found, and we published this paper um, two years ago now, there's a high prevalence of osteopathy around 65% uh, in chronic pancreatitis patients. And this is a cross-sectional analysis of our entry data in the PROCEED uh, study, around 250 or so um, uh, DEXA scans using that as the gold standard. But what's also important in this is that if you look very carefully, it's not just patients who are over 50 years of age. It's not just females. It's high in males. It's also high in young people who would not have been picked up by any screening guideline there are. We've got, look at these 18 to 25-year-olds, 30 to 50, 40-year-olds. I mean, we've got young people with metabolic bone disease, osteopathy, osteopenia, or osteoporosis. So something mechanistically is going on. We've not figured it out yet. We have to study their blood samples and see if we can figure out um, are there cytokines, um, are there um, chemokines, what exactly is going on uh, in these patients. So I'll wrap up with there's ongoing studies from our consortium. We're looking at a lot of things, pain, um, endoscopic therapy. We have a, we have a few um, trials now, clinical trials, looking at lacosamide, which is a medication used for pain. Uh, and pancreatic, um, I mean, cancer pain, and some other studies looking at um, biomarkers. So just to wrap up, so pancreatitis, don't forget the SAPE hypothesis, the sentinel acute pancreatitis event hypothesis, where you have acute pancreatitis, recurrent attacks, scarring, stellate cell mediated TGF beta fibrosis, chronic pancreatitis that leads us to a mechanism and the mechanistic definition. So this is the pathophysiology of this disease. We're starting to understand and unravel the molecular biology of it. There are multiple research gaps, but to really go after these research gaps, we have to figure out what are the mechanisms, what are the mechanisms underpinnings of acute and chronic pancreatitis. And I tried to show you a couple of things that we're looking at that have mechanisms that, are, that have been published and are feasible. One is the inflammasome, and that's why we use lactated ringers. The other is, can we actually approach stellate cell activation with something as simple as endomethacin? And what about bone mineral loss? What is the mechanism behind that? yet to be discovered. So at the DDW uh, this year, there'll be a lot of um, abstracts from the T1 DAPC consortium in the DREAM study and the CPDPC consortium in the PROC study and DETECT, uh, detect uh, study. So thank you uh, very much. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you all for inviting me um, to speak here. I hope I've given you some information that you can help. And I try to make this more of a, you know, an internal medicine grand rounds. You've got some good papers to dive into, to 
update yourself on acute and chronic pancreatitis and understanding why we are in academic medical centers, why we do what we do, why we do the research is because we want to understand the mechanistic underpinnings of the disease to treat the diseases. And um, education, of course, is what this is all about. And you've got, you're now educated more on acute and chronic pancreatitis. You can treat your patients and you understand why you give lactator ringers and why we're doing what we do uh, in those patients. Dr. So thank you very much. Dr. Conwell, thank you very much for an excellent Grand Rounds. And as the chair of the Department of Medicine, you knew exactly what to feed us. So <laughs> very grateful. Thank you. Um, I, I can begin the questions. We have time for a few. Um, one of the uh, questions that are uh, th that we're uh, being uh, that we're trying to deal with in the clinic now, almost on a daily basis, is the use of the GLP-1 agonists and uh, and and other drugs in, in that class. And uh, pancreatitis is always listed as yeah. a concern of in in the use of these drugs, which are now right. almost commonplace. And right. so. The, the question is, is someone who doesn't have a uh, previous history of pancreatitis, um, is, are there any uh, markers or things that one could look for that might predict which individuals would get it and so therefore wouldn't be candidates for this pretty revolutionary drug? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know of any biomarkers or any any predictors uh, of that. And actually, you know, I've not seen, I mean, it, it's reported, but I've not seen a lot of patients get pancreatitis on, on these medications. It, it's out there, it's reported, it does happen. Um, but I'll tell you, there's, there's a there's a wave of patients on these uh, drugs now, but I have not, and I still have an active pancreas clinic. I have not seen any yet in my clinic, um, but they are out there. Um, but I don't know of any biomarkers or predisposing uh, factors that um, that would cause someone to have pancreatitis on these uh, medications. I think as they're used more, we will know. And the only way really to know is to is to rechallenge them, right? Is a drug is a drug rechallenge to see if that really is causing the pancreatitis in those patients. Once you've eliminated, you know, stones and alcohol and the common uh, things, but also under line is, is there a genetic predisposition that we don't know yet um, that related to those drugs that may cause pancreatitis? Or do they have a non-related genetic um, predisposition such as a CFTR mutation or a SPINK1 mutation that may predispose them to pancreatitis and they just happen to have it when they're taking this medication? So those things I think are yet to be uncovered. Thank you. Great, great, great question. There's, there's, there'll be an avalanche of these medications being used uh, now. So I'll, seeing no other, maybe I'll ask one, take the privilege of yeah. something unusual and asking yet a second question. Um, so in the patients with uh, decreased bone density and osteoporosis, yes. is there any evidence that the use of, as we see in, in cancer patients, mm -hmm. the use of some of these anti-resorptive agents, such as decimumab or uh, the like, whether or that affect mm -hmm. the um, ligand antagonists, whether or not they have any effect, not so much on the bone, but whether or not they, by their use, have an effect on pancreatitis. I'm not aware. Of, I'm not aware of any um, literature uh, on that. Um, I do know that you know we we don't know how to treat these patients. You know specifically besides just using the standard of care, um, we would send them to an endocrinologist and ask them to you know help us with um, their treatment. But I don't know if those medications. Um, induce pancreatitis. I've, I've not seen that reported. Um, and I've not seen patients with that in my clinic at all. Not induce, I would think may, may improve it. Oh, may improve the pancreatitis itself. Yeah, that, yeah. that I don't, that I don't know. Yeah. And, and mechanistically, tell me why you think that would happen. Well, because one of the effects that the, these drugs have are on the uh, cytokines mm -hmm. that might be released from the, from the pancreas itself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that'd be that'd be pretty, you know, like a broad, yeah, non-specific, yeah, possibly. I don't know. Be a pretty that'd be a pretty expensive study to do, and you you would need to do that in patients that have recurrent acute pancreatitis that yet you know that have is continue to have attacks, and uh, and that's the group that we need to study with with drug therapy. Well, again, on behalf of the department, I want to thank you and, of course, Dr. Barkin for sponsoring today's lecture. Thank you. Informative Grand Rounds. I want to remind all the participants that in the chat is the link for the CME and the MOC uh, link for the questions. And uh, I wish everybody a wonderful and safe day. And we look forward to seeing you next week, if not before. Dr.